very dark. It's strange. Hey, so I wanted to talk today about our gut health and anxiety and depression and how the food that we eat sort of affects our health. I'm just going to move because I'm a little bit dark at the moment. There we go. So if you've got any questions as I'm going along as well, please feel free to message. The reason I wanted to do this is I was speaking to um, one of my family members the other day and we both struggle with anxiety at times. Um, Touchwood, mine's like a lot better than what it used to be. I'm working on it loads, so it's a whole massive journey for me. Still sometimes get anxiety at night, but again, I'm working on that because it seems like my adrenal glands are overstimulated. So sometimes we don't actually anticipate that f the food that we're eating or the food that we're not eating can be leading to anxiety. So for example, um, Growing up, I had an eating disorder. So what I would do is if I got triggered by something that would upset me um, externally, I would then use food as a method of control to handle what was going on around me. So if something was happening, for example, uh, a few years ago, um, I had a car accident, I ripped my car off, um, I couldn't handle what was going on. Um, I literally came back that day and rather than dealing with the actual situation, the way I know how to sort of control myself is I got straight on the scales. Um, that normally disrupts how I feel. I try not to weigh myself um, as much as possible anymore because that used to rule my life. And by weighing myself, I then could get obsessed with a number. So potentially if I weighed myself and I weighed more, I can then get obsessed with the fact I weighed more. Even if it was like a quarter of a pound or like a tiny little fraction, um, I could then focus on the fact that I was heavier than I'd anticipated. Or if I weighed less than I thought, I would then start panicking that, oh, I weighed less. What do I need to do to keep this weight down? And how do I keep it down more? So by doing that, I didn't have to worry about the fact I'd had a car accident. Instead, what that'd actually do is I'm now totally stressing myself out and overwhelmed by the fact what I've weighed myself, despite what the scale said. Sometimes I don't think the scale's even telling me the truth. So I'd then be like, is it true? Is that right? I need to weigh myself again. And then I'd have the stress of the car accident as well. So I'd be like, I could, then I'd get overwhelmed. So then what I would do is then I would go back to my old ways. My old ways meant not eating. So for instance, I would then be like, right, to feel better, no matter what the scale said, I'd be like, I'm not going to eat today or I'd restrict my calories or say I weighed heavier than what I'd anticipated I would then not let myself eat maybe till like six o'clock in the evening because as we know as we dehydrate we weigh less so by the time it would get to the evening I'd now be totally running on empty been carrying on my normal day and then I would binge uncontrollably because my body would be so hungry so what that would do in the day if I'm not eating, your blood sugars plummet. And I'm a really active person, particularly all these years ago. I'd, most of you know I'd be in the gym sometimes from like 10, 12, 14 hours a day. So if you're not eating, your anxiety is going to go through the roof because your blood sugars massively drop. The body goes into a state of panic. Um, we go into like almost starvation mode. So the body will start telling you that it needs to eat. And the reason we then have these crazy binges is because your blood sugars have got so low and the body's like, whoa, we need blood sugar to survive. So if you're one of these people that's scared of carbohydrates, your blood glucose comes from your carbohydrates. So if you're not fueling your body with the correct carbohydrates or you're totally, totally restricting your carbs, then what's going to happen is your body is then going to be craving anything sugary, which is why people are like, oh, I've, you know, I've eaten really well today, like, my mum, like, I love mummy, and I'll give you a perfect example because we spoke about this every week, and I'm sure she won't mind me sharing this. And what, um, because I learned certain habits from each, like, from each other growing up, so we would use different suppressants to sort of suppress our appetite. Um, my mum tends to use coffee, I did do that when I used to do intermittent fasting because that tends to kill your appetite. Um, but years ago, I'd use diet tablets, and years and years ago, they'd be actually full of speed. Um, I'd take diuretics as well didn't quite know it was speed back then at 14 I was like just give me whatever you can and that would totally cure my appetite but my anxiety would go through the roof but I was medicated for depression because that I back then it wasn't kind of spoke about anxiety it was all about being depressed um obviously I was 
feeling depressed and low because my blood sugars were low. So it's direct correlation. So if you're on a massive strict calorie diet, I've never done the bodybuilder diet essentially. I did do it when I was prepping for my wedding years and years ago. Um, the knock on effect was my hair got really thin. Uh, my anxiety went through the roof. My adrenal glands were like drained to hell. I was still teaching and training and doing everything. So by using suppressants, However, when you're using things like coffee to suppress your appetite, even if you're not doing it intentionally, your blood sugars are going to drop. When you drink coffee, you release cortisol, which is a stress hormone. You release, um, actually you release glucose and you release, um, you get adrenaline in your body um, and you also get calcium. So if you're a heavy coffee drinker um, and you're drinking that quite frequently that day, even if it's not to suppress your appetite, the body releases these hormones and because the body releases cortisol that's your stress hormone so your body's like whoa we're stressed it doesn't know that it's come from coffee it's not it, it doesn't understand that it just thinks you're in a stressful situation it thinks that you're in fight or flight mode like do i need to run for my life or do i need to fight whoever this person is when in real time you're drinking a cup of coffee because you're knackered because you haven't slept properly um your sleep got disrupted in the night because your blood sugars are too low you wake up your body's like, feed me, but you're like, I feel really drained because you haven't slept properly. So you chug a coffee or you drink a Monster or a Red Bull, spike your cortisol level, body goes into fight or flight mode. Then the body crashes because what it does is it releases glucose as well because the body's like, do we need to run or do we need to fight? So by producing glucose from the muscles or wherever it's stored, it goes straight into your body, ready to power you up. When again, in real time, you're sitting there with a cup of coffee, drinking that, maybe getting ready for work so what you're doing when you're drinking certain stimulants is you're releasing all these hormones and chemicals into your body and ironically what's happening is the body doesn't know what to do with those chemicals because you're not actually exercising or you're not running for your life you're not in danger so what happens to the calcium is sorry jamie i don't want to attack you calcium deposits into your body because it's ready for you to activate your muscles instead it's like yo she's just sitting here or he's just sitting here or they're just sitting here having a cup of coffee they don't need this calcium where should we put it calcium then gets deposited onto your joints particularly like knuckles and um, hips so we eventually start developing um arthritis and what's quite frightening is a lot of us don't know where the arthritis or the early onset of things like that are coming from. It's because we're releasing stress hormones into our body from certain stimulants, how we're eating and how we're sort of living, which is quite, you know, intense and it's not really spoken about. Um, however, when I talk to people about coming off coffee, that gives them anxiety. So a couple of things I spoke to my friend about the other day, don't go cold turkey because not everyone can handle that. So some people are really extreme. I remember my ex-partner, um, when he wanted to give something up, it was done, like mad, mad willpower. However, for most of us, when we've given something up, thankfully, I've never really been a coffee addict. I did get addicted to it when I was intermittent fasting, though. So that triggered old eating disorders for me because it gave me a buzz and a sense of power. So I had to recognise I had to walk away from it. I was waking up in the night. I had my heartbeat was crazy. Of course, my body was hungry because it was so cold. Um, I was intermittent fast seven days a week. You're meant to do it like on and off. It's not meant to be like that. So it's finding what works for you. So if you're releasing cortisol into your body, you're releasing glucose into your body, and you're actually trying to lose weight as well, the body then doesn't know what to do with this glucose because you're not exercising or you don't actually need it and your muscles have been restored and regenerated because you've already got a fat supply for that to be reloaded. So the body's like, what do we do with this extra glucose? That can be converted and classically in a woman we have loads of space in our womb it's a vacant area like the body's like where should we put this glucose cysts start forming yeah so if you're struggling with polycystic ovaries or endometriosis or fibroids that can be from the amount of sugars you're taking in or from the stressful coffee or stimulants you're drinking because the body doesn't know what to do with it and then those cysts start forming because basically the glucose goes and it's like where should we put it and that starts causing the cysts which starts um, making our cycles irregular can affect our hair you might find facial hair like boob hair like it's all fun and games so if you are struggling with some people who are like oh i have a really good diet but if you're really stressed or you're having a high caffeine intake that's going to cause cysts and fibroids are basically like a cluster of gunk um, and again, that can be coming from the stress hormones that you're secreting in your body. So back to the, 
I live, like for instance, if you're one of these people like I speak to some of my clients and they're like, I have three or four cups of coffee down, I can't give it up. And I'm like, that's absolutely cool. I don't want you to go cold turkey because we're going to end up rebounding. I don't want that to happen. So if you're looking to reduce your coffee intake, take micro steps, go down the small path, like reduce the cup. If you're like one of these extra large, da 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 da, da make it a little bit smaller, maybe dilute it with a little bit more water. Start off like that. Another great replacement for coffee is pure cacao powder. So if you're chasing that high, it's literally going to give you a buzz. So cacao powder is powerful, especially like, I don't know if any of you have done certain yoga ceremonies, they'd give you like a shot of cacao powder like before it can charge you up. If you're doing breath work, it's a really, really good buzz. Caffeine is also a massive dehydrator. I'm just going to re-drink. Thank you to Conscious Mama for my angel water and my bottle. So again, if you're drinking water, glass, bottle if possible. So if you're drinking a lot of caffeine, you're going to be dehydrated. And when you get dehydrated, anxiety is going to go up. So again, if you're drinking a lot of coffee, like look at your water intake. Because unfortunately, the water in your coffee does not count as water intake. The water you're drinking, as far as I'm concerned, when you're exercising doesn't count as your daily intake because all that's happening when you're training and drinking water is you're just replenishing what you're losing. And it's, I say this all the time in classes and you're probably really bored of me saying it, I think it's about 27 or 28 chemical reactions in water to burn body fat. So if your body's already trying to sort out the caffeine you've got, trying to sort out the foods that you're eating, trying to sort out your brain function, trying to sort out your organs going on. The last thing it's going to have time to, to worry about or prioritise is your water um, use for body fat. So if you're drinking and you wanted to be burning more body fat, increase your water intake. I mean, bodybuilders, classically, they get up to about six litres of water a day. Like, for me, that's way too much. I try and hit the two to three litre a day mark. And again, the quality of the water, if you're drinking from a lot of plastic bottles, it's going to leach a lot of plastics into it. So it's going to disrupt your hormones as well. Decaf. So decaf coffee, lethal. Even if you're a pregnant person, the, sorry to break your heart. The decaffeinated coffee bean is a rotten coffee bean. So you're basically drinking rot. So it's gone off. It's got no caffeine in it, if that makes sense. So you're better off having cacao powder than having decaf. Depends if you want the decaf to chill you out, um, cacao is going to be a stimulant. So again, if if you're looking for just that taste, decaf is rotten coffee beans. Sorry to burst the bubble. Someone did this to me years ago as well about, um, I used to be obsessed with chocolate peanuts. And it's like, you do know they coat all the dead rotten peanuts with the chocolate, right? I can't eat chocolate peanuts anymore because I'm like, ugh. I don't want to be eating rotten things. And it's clever what they do. So yeah, if you're drinking decaf, it just means there's not much caffeine in the bean because the bean's basically gone rotten. Um, so it's not a particularly healthy thing to be doing to your body. Perhaps that'll make you sort of look at it differently as well because different things sort of trigger me. So in regards to fasting, a lot of us, a lot of people ask about fasting and a lot of the spiritual roots talk about fasting as well. But just be prepared if you're going to do fasts that your body's going to have to work harder to keep you warm because there's no, um, you haven't got energy in your body. Your body needs calories. So your body, at night time, you're sleeping. So that's when your body should be healing and doing the work. And that's when your body burns calories. Like you burn calories when you sleep. However, if you're already hungry from the day before, it's like a car. If your petrol tank is full, yeah, you'll be functioning and functioning and functioning and functioning. And then what they say is as the bar gets really low, like the engine starts to struggle, it's pulling in all the dregs. That's what your body's doing as well. It's pulling in the dregs from somewhere and it's just trying to chug along and function. So if you are going to do fasting, really look into it. You can also message me afterwards as well and I'll sort of explain you. There is a post that I've done on intermittent fasting as well and it's about working with your body. But if you're waking up cold in the night or you're really, really cold and you're doing these fasts, um think about it because you're not fueling your body and if you're someone that does struggle with anxiety or even if you don't it's going to start causing anxiety people in the bodybuilding world and stuff as well like their calorie intake gets really really low and really really restricted and then again the anxiety goes up because your body's not able to keep warm your brain function starts shutting off you're going to get forgetful you're going to get brain fog it's quite a 
intense thing to be doing to yourself as well. So look into it properly if you are looking into doing fasting. And again, if you're going to use coffee to be a suppressant for your fast, just be mindful that, again, it's going to cause a lot of dehydration. It's going to increase cortisol and you're going to possibly end up binging in the evenings. Even if you don't binge, say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you might be binging by Thursday, Friday because your body's trying to play catch up because your body's got what we call homeostasis. And everything operates at a certain function. So if you suddenly have a massive calorie drop and your body's like, well, we was working fine over here. After three or four days of being on a really strict calorie diet, your body's going to push you through and it's going to be like, I need some sort of sugar. Um, and it will just, it will go for anything. Have you ever had one of those things where you're like, I just can't stop eating or you'll just keep going and going and going and then you get the guilt and then the guilt causes the anxiety. So it's like this mad cycle. So one thing that me and my cousin were talking about and I wanted to look at his diet because the anxiety had been playing around and we ran through his diet and it was basically it was he's plant-based which is cool i'm pretty much plant-based most of the time um i just i feel better on it and i enjoy what i'm doing with it and i'm enjoying cooking with it but i do have like, i had fish on um, friday last week and um, so i just sort of go with what my body needs or whatever gets kind of sometimes things just get presented to you um so what i noticed with my cousin was he was plant-based he is plant-based and it's pretty cool like He's got his oats in the morning, he's having a smoothie, he's putting his protein powder in, um, and then lunch will be like, I don't know, some quinoa and some sort of um, maybe different grains and stuff, and then dinner was something similar. But what we noticed is no fibre was in the diet. Now, fibre comes from like your leafy green vegetables, and fibre will is, is quite, it's very complex, and fibre slows down the absorption of what you're eating so for instance you'll see a lot of my meals on instagram for those of you that watch some of my stories i'm literally always chucking in like i always buy like 100 grams of spinach and i normally put at least 50 grams if i'm making a meal i put at least 50 grams of spinach in it because it melts down to nothing but it's dense and it's it's hard work for my body to break it down so if you're just eating for instance in the morning Let's say you're in the morning and you're like, I'm just having some fruit. So you've woke up in the morning, you've been sleeping, you might have had a shit night's sleep, you might have a good night's sleep, you might have woke up and you're really tired still. You're like, why am I so tired? I've gone to bed tired, I've woke up. Had someone yesterday telling me she'll go to sleep so tired and then wake up an hour later and be like ready for the day because her adrenaline's firing up all the time. The adrenals aren't shutting off. So by having in the morning, if you wake up and have fruit and you've been technically fasting all night because breakfast is break fast, um your body is like hungry it's been working through the night for you it's been supposedly burning calories for you if it's working optimally if you give it fruit first in the morning fruit's really simple glucose so the body literally even though it's got some fiber in it the body will literally churn through it so what will happen is you have a spike in your blood sugars and then they'll crash and then you're like oh, i'm really hungry so some people go to me oh, i've had breakfast i'm too hungry soon later because you've created this spike so sometimes if you do that, you might even be hungry within an hour, 20 minutes, a couple of hours. So what I'd recommend, especially if you're juicing, juicing is going to remove the fiber. The body needs to burn the calories and the body breaks it down. So if you're eating the fruit rather than blending it, the body has something to work with. It needs to start breaking it down. It needs to start pulling it apart. It takes longer to process, even though it's a simple glucose molecule. However, if you're then blending that fruit, zoop, that's straight through your gut lining. So you're literally going to have a spike and a crash. So if you're like, well, what do I eat? Like for me in the mornings, I have my oats. I tend to have like organic, like big chunky oats. I like them. I feel like I can eat more with them. I generally go with raw sport. Um, I love their protein powder just because I used to have like things like chicken in the morning or eggs and stuff. But again, when I'm more plant-based, it sort of suits me. So I dump like a scoop of protein powder in it. Chia seeds are amazing. They're full of fiber. They're full of good fats. So again, I'll have that. And I put a sprinkle of cinnamon in. Now, cinnamon is epic. Cinnamon helps you control your blood sugars. Cinnamon is really powerful. So again, if you have a lot of sugar cravings, if you add, I remember saying to my dad, I was like, put, tea, um, put cinnamon in your porridge. And he phoned me later and he went, that was disgusting. I was like, how can cinnamon be the He'd put a tablespoon in. That's rank, okay? Don't try and eat a tablespoon of cinnamon, a teaspoon of cinnamon or a sprinkle in your oats. If you're going to stick with the smoothie, that's fine. But I'd recommend putting oats in the smoothie. I'd recommend having things like, if you're going to go for fruits as well, 
have fruits that are got a lower GI. Now, what does that mean? Lower GI means it takes the body longer to break it down in layman's terms. So I traditionally go for more berries because they're more dense, like blueberries, blackberries. Did get some strawberries from Calcott's Farm because they're amazing. So again, I think Colette's like a lover of these strawberries as well. But again, I tend to have fruits that are lower GI. So if you're eating things like bananas, personally, I'd cut the banana in half because it's got a lot of sugar in it. So if you're, um, you don't want to spike your sugar. So if you're already having oats, a banana, peanut butter, da -da -da, this, like if you're already doing that, that's becoming a high carbohydrate thing, which is fine. But just be mindful that you're going to spike and you're going to crash your blood sugars. Now, in order to keep your anxiety or your moods, like if you're constantly going up and down, we, um, we used to call it the lunchtime crash as well, because people would have like sandwich at lunch and a couple of slices, they might have two sandwiches, a couple of slices of bread, then they'll be stacking it with whatever, and then they'll be having their yogurt and this, that, and the other. So if you're going to do something like that, so you say you've had your breakfast and say you've had something that's going to stabilize your blood sugars and you're going to be hungry about three to four hours later, that is normal. Okay. If you go past that three to four hours, what happens is even though your blood sugars are quite stable from a nice morning breakfast, if you go past that, which I used to do, your body then drops rapidly and we call, you go into starvation mode. So the body's like, I'm so hungry. So the body panics. The body doesn't know that you've missed lunch because you had a meeting. The body doesn't know that you missed lunch because you had to run an errand. The body just thinks, shit, we've gone into starvation mode. So the body starts to go on the hunt. However, you're a control freak possibly like me. And you're like, well, you know, the body can wait. So what happens then is later on when you go to have dinner, you're like, you know, I'm, oh, I had, I had lunch a few hours later than normal. That's okay. Okay, so you justify it, which is cool. That's what I used to do. Then you'd have dinner. However, dinner wouldn't touch the sides because your body's like, we went so low. And if you went to the gym in between in the evening or I was teaching a class or whatever, the body's like, you've had dinner. And even though it's a good meal, your body's still ravenous from the, dot, the drop. And that drop might have been from the day before or the day before that as well. Because I used to be like, why do I feel like shit today? I've eaten really well. Ah, yesterday I was running on empty and the day before I ran on empty and the day before... I ate, but it wasn't great and it wasn't a great source. So the body is smart and that's why these sort of uncontrolled binges happen. Now, what I would recommend for me works really well. Have my breakfast, protein with some fats, with some carbs, works for me a treat. Some people might just have fats with protein. Some people, if you're going to have something, combine it. So what does that mean? So if you'd had, say, for instance, a carbohydrate like oats in the morning, have some fats with it to break down the absorption and some fiber. You can have protein. You can have all three together. What you don't want to be doing is just having carbohydrates. Because if you had in the morning your porridge and then you had a banana with it and then you had, um, say, you cooked it with some milk as well and you had some more fruit on top of it. There's nothing in there. There's just carbs, which isn't a bad thing. But what that will do is carbohydrates will spike because you've gone outside your normal blood zone and then crash, which is why people then sort of freak out and go, oh, I don't want to be hungry all the time. I don't want to eat breakfast. And I'm like, but you need to start your day as far as I'm concerned, especially if you, you know, you're quite a high energy person or even if you're running on low moods start your day right because if you start your day right you can power on and I know we all want a flat stomach I know we all want this that, and the other but ironically if you actually ate better and more carbs properly your stomach fat would reduce because your body's not stressed all the time because when your body's stressed because it's like she's not eating or he's not eating or they're not eating it crashes so what the body does when you go into starvation mode here's the heartbreaker so let's say right you've been working really really hard all week and you missed that day before the yesterday and you've dropped. So let's say cursed with then drop down, right? Your body then says, we're in starvation mode. What if she or he or they don't eat for like another day or two? Because the body doesn't know the difference. The body doesn't know whether you're out in the wild, fending and catching your wildlife or your food that you're going to eat. Or it doesn't know we've got an abundance and we've got convenience stores every five minutes and everything's around us. The body doesn't know that. The brain doesn't know that. So what the body does when you go into starvation mode, the body goes, well, next time they eat... I know what we'll do. We'll store that as body fat just in case they do that again. So we're ready, right? So you start sabotaging yourself without even realizing, which is heartbreaking because you're, you're working really hard. So 
blood sugar zone. How do we keep it in the zone to stop starvation mode happening so that what happens is if your blood sugar stays stable, body starts releasing body fat because it realizes we're not in danger. So your blood sugars, how can I break this down? So five grams of carbohydrates is equivalent of one teaspoon of blood sugar. That does not mean 30 grams of carb, 30 gram of oats is equivalent. So if you do 30 divided by five, that would equal six teaspoons. If you actually measured out 30 grams of oats, for instance, on the scale, of which probably 20 grams of that would be carbohydrate and the rest of it would be fiber and did this and the other. So don't get confused by that. So for instance, 100 grams of lentils might have, I think like mung beans is like one of the best ones. So if you can get mung bean, they're epic. So like 100 grams of mung bean will be equivalent of something like 25 grams of actual carbohydrates. So even if you ate 100 grams of say mung beans cooked, 25 grams of that would be carbs. So you do the divide by five rule. So 25 divided by five will give you equivalent of five teaspoons of blood sugar. So let's put this into a normal lunch example. So let's say you're on the go, you grab a sandwich, but you're quite hungry, so you might grab two sandwiches. I think about one slice of bread is equivalent of, I think it's something like 15 grams of carbs. So divide that by five you've got three teaspoons of blood sugar in one slice. So let's say you've had a sandwich, so then you've got six teaspoons of blood sugars. What's inside the sandwich? Say so you've got cheese and whatever else, and whatever else is gonna be carbs in that. So, and you've eaten one sandwich or maybe you've eaten two. So two sandwiches is gonna be equivalent to at least, so we've got six in one, just from the bread alone. And you've had two, then you've got about 12 teaspoons of blood sugar. Then you have your banana, which is probably equivalent of about two teaspoons of blood sugar. So you've gone to six, so you're up to 14 teaspoons of blood sugar at this point. Then you grab a snack bar because you're still a little bit hungry, like they're naked bars or something. And they've got at least maybe 10 grams of carbs or 15 grams of carbs in it. I don't know. Divide that by three. All of a sudden, blood sugars, now to keep them sustained without spiking them, I think it's between four to six teaspoons of blood sugar per meal. So all of a sudden, you've just gone woo up body goes into panic, secretes a shitload of insulin because the body's like, whoa, blood sugars are way too high, dude. And it just secretes it down because it's like, goes into panic mode. It strips it out the bloodstream. So it just goes store it somewhere. Something's going down, shoves it in your muscles. Muscles are full. Where can we put it? Put it on the hips. Put it... Traditionally, actually, blood sugars tend to sit more on the legs um, and the legs and the thighs more um, and the glutes. Stress hormones sit on your hips. Um, so yeah, if you've got a combination of that, if you've got a flat tummy and you can't get rid of the, the love handles, that stress, stress can be from anything, lack of sleep, whatever. So anyway, your sandwich and your lunch meal has spiked blood sugars, you've then depleted it, you've gone into starvation mode. You then don't eat till like eight o'clock in the evening. So your starvation mode has gone even down even more. And it's like, oh my God, panicking. And you've gone to the gym in between and you train, and you're like, yeah, I feel really good. And then you eat. And then like what I said to my mum, what happens in the evening when you eat, when you get home? She's like, I can't stop. And that used to be me. I'd get home and I'd have dinner from my shift or whatever. I'd get home at like nine at night and I'd be like eating dinner. But then I'd be like, I'm ravenous. And I would binge on like 10 tablespoons of peanut butter, night, dates, whatever. And that was like, even though I'd got out of the bulimia phase, the last well, before Corona, I was still binging on peanut. Those of you who know me, like even my nickname's Peanut. Like literally I was the peanut butter queen. And if it isn't peanut butter, it was peanuts. And they are full of fats not great ones and they're full of a load of carbs and so I was spiking my blood sugars before bed and then my poor body at night was just in an absolute state of mess and I was wondering why my sleep pattern was all over the place my anxiety is all over the place I'd have low moods because my body didn't know what to do with me so look at your carbohydrate intake but on a healthy measure so have your fats with your proteins, with your carbs, okay? It's important to balance it out. The beauty of having things like protein with carbs is it will slow down the absorption of the carbohydrate. So it will stop it plummeting so quickly. So you'll feel fuller for longer. You won't be craving things. So main things, balance your carbs with proteins, balance it with fats, add a ton of fiber into your diet, green leafy vegetables and stuff. And that include herbs like, 
you can add things like for flavor as well because it gets mundane it can get boring and it can make you feel sad like so that can affect your moods if you're not changing your diet up like i even though i eat quite similar most days i'll chuck different things in it like i might put coriander in it i might i'm not a lover of parsley but you know if i want to change the flavor like basil and stuff like that that's still fiber and it's still going to change the flavor but adding things like broccoli your greens and stuff is going to be great and it's really anti-inflammatory for your body and if you've been say on medication growing up or there's been even times in your life when you've been on one round of antibiotics it can affect your gut health now when before i was diagnosed with polycystic ovaries i was medicated with antibiotics for three years they couldn't work out what my what was going on with my acne in the end up treating it holistically the consequences of being on that for three years i didn't even know this at the time was i could develop leaky gut syndrome and it doesn't matter whether you've been on the antibiotics for three years you've had one round of them it can be from um, medication it could be if you've had an operation it could be if you you know some people suffer with their sinuses so they're taking loads of headache tablets and then their bellies are always bloated and they can't work out what's going on you know it's a really shitty sort of place to be at so gut inflammation again is going to irritate your body and it's going to also increase things like anxiety and it's going to affect your moods because what happens with um, whether it's leaky gut or candida or anything like that is your gut membrane should have tiny tiny little holes in it and when there's been certain medications or stresses or inflammation in your body those tiny holes get quite big and molecules that you're eating even if it's good foods the, starts leaking into your bloodstream so the stomach should only be allowed to secrete certain things once they've been broken down and it will make a decision you know whether it needs to go into the bloodstream and whether it needs to be excreted out or whether it needs to be fed to the brain or fed to the muscles the problem is when you've got things like leaky gut is these big molecules that might even be toxins that you shouldn't be even getting into your body into your bloodstream start floating around and you're like i've got really bad blow i've got belly ache now the doctors call it ibs they don't even know what ibs is you know there's loads of medications for it so if you're living on gaviscon and stuff like that chances are you've probably got some form of leaky gut or candida look it up research it and start to heal your tummy probiotics are amazing again look at the source where you get it from if you're buying a cheap brand they're probably full of bulking agents and fillers glutamine powder what glutamine powder does is it Bodybuilders used to take it to help with their muscles for healing. What they found as a side effect is those big holes in your tummy line that you've got, glutamine powder acts as like chewing gum and it cements and closes those big holes. So then I would have it before meals three times a day. And what it does, it creates like a layer so your stomach can start actually healing itself. So if you've healed the issue, what's going on, then the body can start healing itself, which is really cool um probiotics are going to help with that as well and digestive enzymes are amazing so you can use them as a collective if you keep eating something though and you keep getting a reaction whether it's like a mucusy cough migraines headaches bad belly you might be intolerant to it or it might just be a case of you've got a bit of leaky gut going on there or candida and you need to treat it because it might not be that you're intolerant to it however it might just be where you've got something going on in your body and you're not healing it then that potentially is, is still going to keep irritating you. So, and again, that affects your moods because if you feel bloated, you feel shit. Like, come on, especially during your period, women. Like, do you know what I mean? Last thing you want is an extra bloat with the bloat on top of that. It's just, it's just not pleasant. Same with like, if you're in pain, I used to wake up the next day and I felt like people, like someone had stabbed me and it was twisting. I thought, I've been asleep. Surely whatever is in my system, no, your body's still fighting it. You can feel it in your back, your belly. Things that cause inflammation and can start causing irritation in the gut and playing havoc with your moods or anxiety. If you're having things like artificial sweeteners, this is really important as well if you're giving your kids things that are sugar free. So basically what things that say are sugar free are an artificial sweetener and what they do is, yeah, it tastes good and it tastes sweet. One it's very addictive so the body sugar is one of the most addictive things is they say it's as addictive as heroin which is quite frightening so if you've already got sugar addiction and then you're replacing it with artificial sweeteners whether it's a low fat muller like yogurt whether it's a sugar-free robinson's or whatever it is your body is still going to respond to it like it's actual sugar so what happens is say you've had a fat-free yogurt or say you've had sugar-free orange squash or your kids or whoever's had it the body's like yo there's sugar in the body so the body secretes insulin which is the receptor to recognize that and it starts going down 
and it gets into the body and it's like there's no sugar here because an artificial sweetener is a fake sweetener there's, there's nothing there it just stimulates that taste so the body's like hmm are we broken so it starts turning off those receptors so what happens is your ins insulin sensitivity goes down which means that before when you'd have actual sugar in your body your body could actually start processing it and stuff now it's like oh no 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 we was wrong again those sugars then start being converted stored into polycystic ovaries fibroids all different things go up gut inflammation can affect brain health and um, it's linked to things like alzheimer's and stuff like that as well it's quite frightening so as well if you're it's starting to show like a lot of kids are getting type 2 diabetes quite early on now which is quite frightening because we think we're doing sugar free so how do we get around things like this water look at what you're actually putting in if you if you're a juice lover if you love juice like um i was saying to my friend the other day like he bought this ginger and apple juice again there's no fiber in it it's just pure glucose for your body to feed on so if you've already got candida or leaky gut the body just goes nuts things like thrush whether you're male or female you still get thrush it can start coming through your tongue start affecting um discharge and stuff in your body so again if you're struggling with it it's probably a bit of candida going on in your body that you need to sort of look at so again, think about what you're actually putting into your body and what you're feeding yourself because you could be feeding um, the bad bacteria that are then feeding and that candida and things like that can spread around the whole body. Same if you've got endometriosis, it starts going everywhere and it can be like on a whole massive rampage and it starts causing autoimmune and it starts causing, why am I so tired and I've got no energy? Your body's feeding on itself in a bad way. So look at that. Um, oils. So I posted about this the other day. If you're using cheap oils like sunflower oil, vegetable oil and stuff like that, it's all good and well. But when you heat it up, because it's it becomes, when you heat it up, you change the chemical structure of it. And it's quite scary because it becomes a man-made fat. And your body has enzymes to break down things that are natural. So if you've converted something without realizing because you've overheated the oil and it starts, one way to tell if something's gone rancid, it starts steaming or the oil starts smoking chuck it in the bin, start again. So if it becomes rancid, what it does is it turns into a molecule your body could have broken down and excreted to a man-made product. So it basically becomes like plastic. The body then doesn't know what to do with it because it's plasticky and it can't use it because it doesn't know what to do with it and it doesn't recognize it. So it stores it around your arteries. So you know, a lot of people go to me, oh, my friend eats loads of junk and they're really slim and blah, blah, blah. They're skinny fat, so don't be fooled arteries are starting to build around it because man-made fats margarine i think perfect i think it's margarine one dna molecule away from being plastic so if you're eating certain things and you're turning them rancid or they're already man-made your body starts clogging your arteries and your heart which is what leads to heart disease and things like that so i don't want to scare you but just start thinking about it a little bit um an alternative sweetener to coffee um that's a good question I would use something natural like honey because at least it's a real molecule because your body can at least break it down because why have something man-made when you could have something in your body could actually excrete properly. However, if you're already having coffee, you're already secreting glucose, then you're going to pump honey into it. Glucose goes through the roof, cortisol goes through the roof. Um, like I said, you said that you wanted a flat tummy, Benita. So again, you're going to store body fat. So it's going to start storing on your hips and stuff. So personally... I would start to reduce it over time, maybe choose a more natural sugar to have in the meantime, and then start to sort of slowly wean yourself off with that. I hope that answers that question. Um, alcohol. So I'm not a big drinker. Um, I'll drink, those of you that know me, I normally drink Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, and like I enjoy it. Um, but generally alcohol is a depressant. Um, it can make your moods really, really low. So you might have drank on Saturday night and feel like shit by Wednesday because the body, um, it's, it pollutes the body, it's a toxin. And what actually happens as well is alcohol, because it's a toxin, takes priority. So if you've eaten food, even if it's in the day or the next day, the body will prioritise getting rid of the alcohol out of the system because it's a toxin. So you cock block your fat loss if you're looking to fat, if you're looking to lose body fat, the body will choose to remove the toxins from the proteins and it will excrete them out of the body. Not in a good way because then the proteins and that you should have been digesting all the other things for nutrients and so you might be doing really well. 
you know, people are, are you really healthy? But I just have a couple of glasses of wine a night. And I'm like, you are literally cock blocking your gains. It's it's actually jokes because your body's going to choose that toxin as a priority. So what that means is all the good stuff that you're eating just kind of gets washed through because the body's like, get this out, get this out. It's really important. And the molecules that should be breaking the protein down are actually breaking down the alcohol. The alcohol goes straight through your gut lining because it's quite a simple molecule. So if you still do love a drink, that's fine. I would choose what you're drinking wisely. So if you're a heavy wine drinker, like the quality of the wine can make a difference because if you're drinking a cheap wine, you're probably going to have a lot of hangovers. There's a lot, there's even more toxins in it because they've used it to bulk it. So you're literally polluting your body. Um, I don't touch wine. I can't stand it. It just makes me way too drunk. I am lightweight as it is. But if I was going to do it, I'd go for a more expensive, or I would research the brand and what I'm drinking because... I don't want the hangover and I want it to not be as toxic. So again, if you're drinking a cheap product, it's going to be riddled with stuff. It's pretty simple. So again, like quality of health, depending on what your goals are, everything in moderation. I totally believe that as well. However, if you're going to be doing something in moderation, having your glass or two a night, why not have moderation with actually something that's actually not going to be as harmful as like a cheaper brand or something that's going through. I don't know enough about wines to sort of recommend brands. Um, they some say that red wine's better than white. Again, it's all a form of sugar as far as I'm concerned, but it can. They say red wine can help lower your blood pressure, but I haven't really researched into that too much. If I was on a night out, hopefully it will be soon at some point. I tend to have vodka or gin. Um, I tend to drink that normally with a tonic. Um, I add a little bit of lime cordial to it just to take the taste away. But again, it's probably got artificial sweeteners in, so um, I squeeze fresh lime in. I'm just drinking out of a glass bottle case, um, special case. My friend um, does angel water. So it's been um, reverse osmosis. So it removes all the fluoride and all the nasty chemicals from tap water and stuff like that as well. So again, that's something to sort of look into. Um, alcohol also causes inflammation. So if you've already got leaky gut going on, or even if you haven't got leaky gut, like potentially that's going to give you leaky gut or candida. If you're drinking cocktails, again, there's a ton of sugar in there. There's going to be fruit. There's going to be different like rums and stuff like this. So again, like be mindful like of what you're drinking and stuff, if that makes sense. Um, salts. If you're just normally using normal salt, it's refined. It's been bleached. It's been stripped and it hasn't got its original properties in it. So again, it's, it's going to have a higher thing of MSG. I can't remember the, like, the long name of it. MSG affects your blood pressure um, and which will affect your anxiety. So if you're struggling with things like anxiety as well, having refined salt and having loads of salt on your food can affect that. So I stay, stick with Himalayan salt and rock salt and use that. And again, if you're using soy, soy sauce and soy products, they're going to be riddled with MSG. Again, that has a massive inflammation on your body. It just disrupts loads of uh, chemicals and hormone receptors. So I recommend things like coconut aminos and liquid aminos for flavorings because they don't have MSG in them. So they're going to have they're not going to have those properties to cause more inflammation in your body. Um, inflammation can come out anywhere. It can be in the gut. You might see swelling on your face. You might be like swelling on your arms. Like inflammation can be um, where you're eating certain foods and changing them to man-made fats. Like, you know, you're going to have toxins. Your lymph nodes start getting blocked. When the lymph nodes get blocked and things like that, that's when cancers and things start developing. So even if you've gone from having a bad diet and you've changed it over the years, one thing I do now is lymphatic drainage. So, I, you know, there's still toxins in your body. So I use the dry brushing just to move it out of the system as well. Meat. So like I said, I've gone more plant based. I was vegetarian growing up from eight to 26, ate meat for a few years. And now I've just sort of dabble in it. Years ago, it was more for a control thing. Now it's just because of just the quality of the meat, because if animals are grass fed and organic, that's different like to an extent. But nowadays, the farming world is about bulking up the animal as fast as and quickly as possible. So cows should be grass fed. They should be herbivore. They're being fed grains. They're being fed things to make them way more. So you are now eating an animal that should have been a herbivore that's been converted into a grain fed and they give them antibiotics and they give them certain things that you are consuming in your body. So be mindful of the sources of the meat that you are consuming because if you're trying to lose weight and stuff as well and that animal's been pumped full of chemicals, you're eating those chemicals. It's a simple cycle. You're eating what they're eating. Whereas if they was grass fed and it was natural back in the day, we would be eating those sort of things. So again, be mindful where you choose your meat sources from and what you're doing, because again, it causes inflammation in the body, which is quite frightening. 
if you are a meat eater, like I recommend most people like have more white meats because it's like fish and things like that. But again, just be mindful because a lot of the fish now get fed all these grains. So they're bulking the fishes out and a lot of animals are getting sick. So we're now eating animals that are sort of getting sick. So it's becoming this whole cycle. But again, and processed meats, like things like... I said this to my mum the other day, um, if you're going to feed even one of your pets processed meats, whether it's tin food, whether it's packs of ham and stuff like that, it's going to be riddled with MSG, processed salts, animals are getting sick, animals are getting cancers, animals got bad bellies, like sometimes their farts will stink and stuff like that as well. So be mindful what you're feeding your pets because, you know, they're little people, like they're little bods too. So it's really important that you look after them. Um, And another thing as well is, have more lean meats that's what i mean like white meats so fish and stuff what's great with fish as well is a lot of oily fish preserve themselves so they don't if you're buying stuff that's in in the supermarket and stuff the oils from the fish preserves itself whereas with the chicken and stuff you look at the back of the chicken there's going to be certain things to preserve it to keep it on the shelf life you know if you've left chicken for a few days where it will stink it will be rank like you know whatever's in there to preserve it's like it's just gross it's killing off the flesh and everything so the fish is going to have more likely to have oils on it. So just be careful as well if you're eating a lot of tin food because the mercury content as well, because again, that causes massive disruptions in your body, affects your adrenal glands as well. So you can suffer with anxiety and things like that. Be cautious of what you're doing. Um, one thing as well I say to my clients is like make your own dressings. So, you know, you could use your own rock salt or Himalayan salt, add salt and pepper, add different herbs use extra virgin olive oil um avocado oils this is another point as well so things like coconut oil can be heated at a much higher temperature before they turn rancid i don't even know i don't actually know enough but i don't know if coconut oil does turn rancid by cooking with it some people don't like the taste so you can get the one with like the different taste i don't quite know how the difference of the properties are but you can heat it at a much higher temperature which means it won't turn rancid which means that when you're eating it you've not converted that into a man-made fat so your body can excrete it naturally please don't think of the word fat as being fat because that's what society has brainwashed us with avocados and things like that they're good fats your body can break it down fats are a source of energy it's they're amazing so don't get confused with thinking i am fat with eating fat because fats are great but again moderation if you're a nut lover they're full of fats which is great but handful of nuts because they're also high carbohydrate high calorie content but they're really nourishing for the body things like peanuts unfortunately are not that nourishing and it's something i'm really working on getting away from but i just love peanuts i just can't have them in the house anymore just can't have it um and as well like don't get sad with eating the same thing add color to your food like when i went to the farm they had like they've got different variety of courgettes and stuff so it's like yellow courgettes and eat foods that are colorful and aesthetic to your eyes so you get excited about your meals like i had like pomegranate in a salad so you can be like summer's coming like I, this is my favorite season for like like spring onions and i'll make fresh salads and i'll put um things like pomegranate in it or a bit of watermelon again like moderation i might put some chopped walnuts in it like just things for fun just to sort of so you don't get sad because like i said eating the same food when i was prepping years ago for when i was getting married like i was eating chicken breast sweet potato spinach like five times a day and it got to the point where i was really sad and my hair was falling out and loads of stuff was going on my anxiety was going through the roof i was having panic attacks all the time because of the hair but actually the reason i was having panic attacks is because my body was so hungry so i was already so anxious the hair was just the trigger like then the panic attacks would come so it's it's a whole combination of what you're doing um final words before i check off because i've got a client in a minute so think about balancing your foods if you're going to do things like fasting, look into it properly. Don't do it consistently because, again, your anxiety is going to go through the roof and it's going to trigger you. Um, if you are struggling with an eating disorder and stuff like that as well, so by restricting your calories, your moods get really, really low and you're going to spike. Um, if you're a heavily, like, you're dependent on things like caffeine and that, reduce everything in moderation because you're going to get headaches. You're going to feel like shit because your body's detoxing. It's part of the cycle. I think it'll be like three or three to five days if you're going to do it. But, you know, start yourself off slowly if it's too overwhelming to go full in. Like, don't do it all at once. Pick one or two things. This is where we fuck up, especially after Christmas. Everyone's like, I'm going to be really good. Pick one or two things in your life to start with. OK, don't try and go the full hog because you're going to fail. Like most of us then will be like, this is too hard. Um. The word instead of caffeine is cacao, C-A-C, 
CAO, pure cacao powder. If you are a Costco member, they do like five, six, seven hundred grams of this stuff for four ninety nine. Okay, it's good shit. And again, I put a teaspoon of that in my um, porridge in the morning. It's really good to unblock your pineal gland. Your pineal gland is responsible for secreting melatonin and DMT. Most of our pineal glands are blocked. So things like cacao powder and changing your diet is going to start to unblock it, which is going to increase the release of melatonin, which is your sleep hormone. That's fabulous, which means if you sleep better, you're going to burn more calories. You're going to lose body fat. You're going to feel better. Your energy is going to be better because you had a better night's sleep. Unblock your pineal gland. It is so important. Um, yeah, my I will do a video on it. To be honest, my hair is a lot thinner than what it used to be. My thyroid is functioning a bit low at the moment because my adrenal glands are overstimulated still. I'm actually going to see an acupuncturist in a couple of weeks because if you've ever had any surgeries or anything with a scar tissue on your body, things I've been learning is it's affecting certain glands in our body. So my adrenal glands are stimulated, so I still find it really hard to go to sleep at night. By seeing an acupuncturist, hopefully it will start unblocking those channels, which will start resetting my adrenal glands, which will reduce the anxiety that I have at night, which means I'll start sleeping better. So again, if you've got any scar tissue in your body, like from surgeries or anything like that, or even if you you feel like you've got a lot of anxiety, look into acupuncture and reflexology. Highly, highly, so many benefits to it. Um, I'm going to obviously document. I've never had acupuncture before, but everything's sort of leading me to that direction. So I will share that journey when I go on that. I hope I've answered as many questions as I can. Anything else, just private message me. Um, if you want a private one-to-one -one or anything, you know where I am. Peace and love, guys and girls. Take care. Have a great, what is it, Friday? Amazing.